What exactly is differentiation? Furthermore, how can we perform differentiation? And what kinds of problems can we solve using differentiation? To even know how to perform differentiation, we need to first know what is differentiation. Consider a function and a point that lies on the function. We want to find the gradient of the curve at this point, which is equivalent to the gradient of the tangent. Let's move delta x units to the right and consider a corresponding point on the curve. We're going to consider the gradient of the blue line, which can be calculated via the rise, which is delta of f of x, over the run, which is delta of x. Let this delta x get smaller and smaller and smaller. And in the limit, when delta x approaches 0, we will obtain the actual gradient of the curve at the point. This is called the derivative of the curve, and it is denoted by the symbol d over dx. For this particular curve, we are looking at the function f of x equals to x squared. We can calculate its derivative by first calculating the rise. Since f of anything equals to anything squared, we can plug in the respective inputs, and the x squares cancel each other out. The gradient can then be approximated by dividing out delta of x, which leaves us with 2x plus delta x. Finally, to get the actual gradient, we'll consider the limit as delta x approaches 0. On the left side, we obtain the derivative of x squared. On the right side, the delta x approaches 0, and we are left with 2x. To abbreviate, we also use the notation f prime x to mean the same thing as the derivative of the function f. Using this technique, we can derive three really crucial derivatives. Firstly, the derivative of x to the n is n times x to the n minus 1. We bring the power down and subtract the power by 1. Secondly, the derivative of the sine function is the cosine function. And lastly, the derivative of the exponential function is the exponential function. From these basic derivatives, we can derive many other useful derivatives. A natural question to ask is, if we have a composite function, that is the function f being plugged into the function g, what is its derivative? Following the definition of gradients, we're going to consider the rise, which is the change of g of f, over the run, which is the change of x. We could rewrite this fraction in terms of a change in g of f divided by the change in f times the change in f divided by the change in x. As we allow the change in x to approach 0, the change in f also approaches 0. On the left side, we obtain the derivative of the composite function g of f. On the right side, the first term simplifies to the composite function g prime of f and the second function simplifies to f prime of x. This is known as the chain rule, and we can use the chain rule to calculate the derivative of the cosine function. The cosine of x is the sine of the complement of x, which is pi over 2 minus x. Since we have the function pi over 2 minus x inside the sine function, we can apply the chain rule. We'll first differentiate the outside function into cosine followed by differentiating the inside function. The cosine of pi over 2 minus x is the cosine of the complement of x, which gives us the sine of x. The derivative of pi over 2 minus x is simply negative of 1. Completing the algebra, we obtain that the derivative of the cosine function is precisely the negative of the sine function. Can we calculate the product of two functions? Consider a rectangle with base f of x and height g of x. We're going to increase x just a little bit, and the increase in the length of the base is known as the change in f, and the increase in the length of the height is the change in g. To calculate the derivative, we first obtain the change in the total area, which is made up of three portions, a1, a2, and a3. a1 has base change in f and height g. Therefore, its area is the change in f times g. Similarly, a2 has area of change in g times f. Finally, a3 has area of the change in f times the change in g. 
This is the rise, which we will divide by the run, and we get the derivative as we allow the change in x to approach 0. Since the last term is simply 0, we would cancel that out, and we are left with the product rule for differentiation. The product rule and the chain rule together helps us calculate the derivative of the quotient of two functions. We can rephrase division by g as multiplication by g to the power of negative 1. This allows us to write the quotient as the product of two functions. We can now apply the product rule, that the derivative of the product is the derivative of the first function times the second function plus the derivative of the second function times the first function. The first term simplifies to f prime times g to the negative 1, while the second term can be differentiated via the chain rule. As an exercise, you can show that the algebra simplifies to this formula. This is known as the quotient rule for differentiation. And having calculated the derivative of both sine and cosine, a natural question would be, what's the derivative of the tangent? We can write the tangent as sine over cosine. And since we have a quotient of two functions, we can apply the quotient rule, which requires us to differentiate the numerator times the denominator, subtracted by the derivative of the denominator times the numerator all over the denominator squared. The derivative of sine is cosine, and the derivative of cosine is the negative of sine. We can rewrite the numerator to get cosine squared plus sine squared, and a very common identity in mathematics is that this numerator, cosine squared plus sine squared, equals 1. But 1 over cosine is simply the secant, which tells us that the derivative of the tangent function is simply the function secant squared. We could use the quotient rule to derive many useful formulae that may or may not be familiar to us. Having calculated the derivative of the cosine function, can we then calculate the derivative of the secant function? We can write the secant function as 1 over the cosine function. And since we have a quotient of functions, we can apply the quotient rule. Differentiating the numerator gives us 0, and differentiating the denominator gives us the negative of sine. We can simplify with a little bit of algebra and obtain 1 over cosine times sine over cosine. This tells us that the derivative of the secant function is precisely the product of the secant and the tangent. But using this formula, we can very quickly derive the derivative of the cosecant function. We can write the cosecant of x as the secant of the complement of x. So differentiating the outer function, secant, gives us secant times tangent, and differentiating the inner function, pi over 2 minus x, gives us negative 1. Since the secant of the complement of x is simply cosecant of x, and the tangent of the complement of x is simply cotangent of x, we see that the derivative of the cosecant function is simply the negative of the product of the cotangent function and the cosecant function. We've seen the logarithm many times, but what is its derivative? While it might not be obvious from the onset how to go about finding this derivative, a key trick is to get rid of the logarithm. How do we do that? We will apply the exponential on both sides. From this, we can differentiate both sides with respect to x. The left-hand side is a function y inside another function, the exponential. This allows us to use the chain rule. But the exponential of y is simply x, and y is simply the logarithm of x. This helps us obtain the derivative of the logarithm to equal 1 over x. We can play the same game with the arctangent of x. We can apply tangent on both sides, then differentiate both sides with respect to x. Applying the chain rule, this tells us that dy over dx is simply 1 over the square of secant of y, and by a trigonometric identity, is 1 plus the square of the tangent. And since the tangent of y is x, the derivative of the octangent of x is simply 1 over 1 plus x squared. Using this same idea, here are some exercises that we can try. Firstly, we can try to find the derivative of the arcsine of x. Secondly, we could try to find the derivative of the arc cosine of x. Finally, we could even try to prove the general derivative 
of an inverse function. However, what about the expression sine of x plus y equal to x plus y all squared? There is no way that we could isolate y purely in terms of x. But it turns out we can still calculate the derivative of y with respect to x. We apply the derivative on both sides. On the left side, the function x plus y lies inside the function sine. This allows us to use the chain rule. Differentiating a sine gives us cosine, and differentiating x plus y gives us 1 plus dy over dx. On the right side, the derivative of y squared is 2y times dy over dx by the chain rule. Using a little bit of algebra, we can isolate dy over dx. We call this implicit differentiation since y is trapped inside the function implicitly. But what if the reverse situation happens? What if x and y are not connected directly to each other but are instead controlled by this letter t? How could we calculate dy over dx in this circumstance? While it's not obvious from the onset what we should do, we could first try to differentiate x with respect to t to obtain 1 plus e to the t, and we could differentiate y with respect to t as well, giving us 1 plus the cosine of t. By shifting our perspective on the chain rule just a little bit, we could write dy over dx to equal dy over dt times dt over dx. But the expression dt over dx could be shown to equal 1 over dx over dt. And since we know what dy over dt and dx over dt are, we could plug in the expressions and obtain dy over dx purely in terms of t. This is known as parametric differentiation since we are differentiating with respect to the parameter t. So it turns out that we can carry out differentiation on many kinds of expressions, either functions or implicit equations. But what kinds of problems can we solve using differentiation? The first problem we'd like to solve is the very first problem that we posed at the beginning. Considering a point that lies on the graph of a function, applying differentiation allows us to obtain the gradient of the curve at that point, and the coordinates of the point help us obtain the equation of the tangent to the curve. And as the point moves on the curve, the equation of the tangent changes as well. A natural question in many of the natural sciences is to ask, what would be the equation of a line that's perpendicular to the tangent? This is known as the normal to the curve at the point, and we could try to calculate the gradient through a rough approximation. And once we have an approximate gradient, we can obtain the equation of the normal. And likewise, as the point on the curve changes, so does the equation of the normal. But something remarkable happens when we calculate the gradient of the tangent multiplied by the gradient of the normal. The product of the gradients will always equal the negative of 1, no matter which point we obtain on the curve. Differentiation is really useful as well in helping us optimize various quantities. Consider this particular graph and a point that moves along the graph. As the point moves along the curve, it obtains a local minimum. At the local minimum, the gradient of the curve is zero. Furthermore, we know that it's a local minimum because if we nudge this point a little bit to the left, its gradient becomes negative. While if we nudge it a little to the right, the gradient will become positive. This is known as the first derivative test for local minimum. Likewise, for local maximum, the gradient to the left of the turning point is positive, and the gradient to the right of the turning point is negative. This tells us that that particular stationary point is a local maximum. However, sometimes the gradient of the curve remains negative. This means that the stationary point is a point of inflection. And likewise, if the gradient of the curve remains positive, we obtain yet another stationary point of inflection. If finding derivatives were easy, we could even calculate the second derivative at the point, which is defined to be the derivative of the first derivative. Thinking of it this way, since the local minimum increases from being negative to positive, the gradient of the derivative has to be positive. And likewise, since passing through a local maximum, the derivative decreases from positive to negative, the gradient of the derivative has to be negative. This is known as the second derivative test 
for local extrema. But if we could calculate the second derivative, if we differentiate one more time, we can obtain the third derivative. And in general, we can consider the nth derivative of a function, which is differentiating n times to the original function. This has geometric analogs to tangents and normals and can be calculated through all our different means, including implicit differentiation. A very useful application of this idea is in economics. The profit earned by a company is the difference between its revenue and its cost. In order to maximize the profit, we can calculate the derivative of the profit. But the derivative of the revenue is simply the marginal revenue, and the derivative of the cost is simply the marginal cost. For a firm to maximize its profit, the derivative of the profit ought to be zero. This gives us the first condition when the marginal revenue equals the marginal cost. However, to ensure that this is the maximum profit, we insist that its second derivative be negative. We can plug in the derivative of the profit with the marginal revenue minus the marginal cost, and we need to ensure that the derivative of the marginal revenue is smaller than the derivative of the marginal cost. In economics, this is obtained when the marginal revenue is decreasing and when the marginal cost is increasing. This satisfies the condition we require for profit maximization. Can we approximate functions using polynomials? Take a function f of x and calculate f of 0, that is, substituting x equals to 0. Now we add the second term, which is the first derivative of f at 0, multiplied by the function x. For the third term, we'll have the constant f double prime of 0, which is the second derivative of f, divided by 2 factorial, times the square of x. And in general, the nth term in our polynomial approximation is the nth derivative of the function f at 0 divided by n factorial, all multiplied by x to the n. This is known as the Maclaurin series of f, sometimes known as the Taylor series of f at 0. Many functions that we've seen have Maclaurin expansions. For example, the exponential function, the cosine function, the sine function, the power function, and finally, the logarithm function. Since we are approximating sine with such a long polynomial and cosine with such a long polynomial as well, when x is sufficiently small, any power of x which is higher than 2 would essentially be negligible. So we can approximate sine of x with x and the cosine of x with 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial. This helps us obtain a small angle approximation for the tangent of x. We can write sine over cosine as sine times cosine to the negative 1. We can substitute our approximations for the sine and cosine of x, and the expression 1 minus x squared over 2 to the negative 1 has a Maclaurin expansion as well. We can carry out a bit of algebra, and since powers of x higher than 2 are negligible, tangent of x can be approximated by x itself. These ideas give us an entire toolkit of differentiation in a nutshell.